Robert Nauer, CPCM, CPPO, back here once again for another podcast. Today, I'm going to talk about ethics and integrity in government contracting and contracting in general. Over my lifetime, whether as a contract specialist, a contracting officer, an administrative contracting officer, or as a contract administrator, or just in private life doing contracting to build a home. I have encountered so many unique ethical dilemmas and had to have the required and prerequisite personal integrity in order to do the right thing each and every time. For it is if you do not do the right thing each and every time in government contracting, it will eventually catch up with you. And it may be so grievous that you may end up going to trial and being put in prison. I've known quite a few people who have breached some issues in government contracting that have gotten themselves in a lot of trouble. Uh, And I could have also gotten myself in a lot of trouble, too. And, of course, I'm going to focus here strictly on government contracting. But it doesn't matter whether you're a Supply Corps officer, a Flag officer, a GS civilian, um, or a public official. You have to have integrity. And integrity is something you don't just acquire. It's built over time, it's learned, it's a behavior, it's values that are instilled in you by your parents and those that helped mentor you, and hopefully they taught you the right lessons, just like my grandfather taught me to have integrity and gave me a basis for having personal ethics in all types of situations. So here we go. And I think the first one that I'll start out with is one of my former administrative contracting officers at DCMA Lockheed Martin Orlando, and she won't mind me talking about this. I loved her dearly, and we're still friends. Her name was Lois Davis, or Lee. Lee had a tremendous amount of personal integrity as a contracting official, and as a subordinate to Lee at the time, I looked to her for advice. Of course, she understood what my background was. And so here it goes. There was a Navy captain in charge of PMA 260 at Nav Air in Patuxent River, Maryland. This particular Navy captain, he has a lot of power over PMA 260, and he ended up getting himself in a lot of hot water, and he didn't get promoted. One day, I made the fatal mistake as a GS-11, and I had been formerly a GS-12 up in Ohio, but I had to take a downgrade and give up my job in Ohio to go to Orlando to take care of my demented father, who later died of Alzheimer's, but that's beside the point. I stayed late at work one day. My normal work day would have ended at 4 or 4.30, depending upon when I came in. And so around 5 p.m., and I was already an hour overtime, I made the fatal mistake of uh, placing a phone call because I had received an emergency phone call from Lockheed Martin, and I was the only one left in the office. And it was for a CASREP item. A CASREP is a high, very high priority one item to, that we needed to ship over to the fleet in the Mediterranean. Lockheed Martin maintained a pool of assets an erodible pool that if one was taken out, the other one would be replaced and repaired by the defective one that would later be repaired. Um, Assets were expensive and critical. And this was for a CAS system. So I called the duty officer. 
at least so I thought, at PMA 260, as I was ex expected to do, to get approval to give authorization to Lockheed Martin to release that asset and have it shipped to FedEx immediately to the ship in the fleet in the Mediterranean that needed this item and had a downed item or a CAS rep. So I did that. And I got on the phone and uh, the phone picked up and immediately I went into my spiel and I said, hi, this is Mr. Nauer at DCMA Lockheed Martin Orlando. I'm calling to get approval for a particular asset. Uh, and before I could get another word out of my mouth, this Navy captain, and I'm not going to say his name because he's already suffered enough consequences for his rude and profane behavior, but he immediately launched into me going, who the fuck do you think you are? Who the fuck told you to call this number? Who the fuck are you to be calling me, a Navy captain, to tell me what the fuck I need to do? Well, needless to say, whether you're a civilian or military, I, probably if you're military like I had been, such language would not necessarily shock you, but at the same token, I was now a civilian, and that kind of language was uh, unacceptable, to say the least. So I was kind of shell-shocked. I almost didn't know what to say to him. And I said, but, 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 sir, I'm calling because, and he goes, I don't give a goddamn why you're calling, blah, blah, blah. You don't fucking call my office. And I said, but, sir, that's the protocol. And, and I hung up on him at that point, which I probably should have hung up immediately when he launched into his cursing. Well, I was, I was so in shock, I called the commander's office across town and explained what had just happened. And um, the commander and the colonel over there both said, um, we'll look into this matter. That's typically sweep it under the carpet kind of shit. But so I then called another uh, administrative contracting officer who I knew that was working over at the east, uh, east the western plant, and she said, "Oh, that command, that navy captain has no business speaking to any civilian like that." And I said, "Well, I kind of know that, but you know, what am I going to do? What I, we need to get this item approved." So anyway, evidently. The colonel at the Western plant approved the CAS rep, and Lockheed Martin got to release it. And the very next morning when I came into work, all hell broke loose because um, the colonel in charge of DCMA in Orlando called PMA 260's boss, who was an admiral, and complained about PMA 260's boss cursing me out for simply doing my job. And, of course, I wanted to write a letter and place a phone call to the Secretary of the Navy and file a formal complaint about this Navy captain. But, of course, they didn't want it to go that far. So, as a result, uh, they said, we will fly up there and we will talk to this Navy captain and we will have him give you an apology. Well, I can tell you, number one, that apology never came, and even though they flew up there to Pax River to seek an apology to me from this Navy captain in charge of PMA 260, uh, they didn't get it. They just got the runaround, and he was like, blah, 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 well, you know how things go. And, and as far as I was concerned, I said, well, that's the last fucking time I'm ever going to call PMA 260. So pretty much the end of the story. Everybody in the entire DCMA office in the eastern plant and the western plant heard about what this captain had done. Well, a number of months, if not a year later, as we were closing out the CAS program, uh, Lee Davis, my boss, who was a 13 and uh, the ACO, she also had a run-in with the same Navy captain. He was kind of a horse's ass to begin with. But if you're a horse's ass and you think you have lots of power, kind of like Putin, 
well, you think you can get away with murder. Putin can, but this Navy captain couldn't. So, Lee was following all the required contractual protocols of the FAR and the DFARs and of our rules for DCMA. She had to have certain things done before she would approve a progress payment to Lockheed Martin. And there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of processes and hoops to go through before you can just approve a substantial multi-million dollar progress payment for Lockheed Martin. And so the captain, the same horse's ass, called down and he demanded to know who the fuck the ACO was and why the hell the progress payment hadn't been made and why the hell she wasn't doing her job, something like that. And Lee said, first of all, you don't speak to me as a female that, and tell me things like that. I am the ACO, not you, and I will release the progress payment when I'm damn good and ready. And her blood pressure must have gone through the roof, just like mine did. And... She was also shell-shocked by the way this Navy captain had behaved at her and spoken to her. And she felt just like I did. She demanded an apology, and she was going to report him. And, and then once again, the colonel got involved. And, of course, Lee already knew from my experience that she wasn't going to get anything. But she was willing to take it a little bit further. And I kind of wish I had her on this podcast so she could talk about it. But I know she probably wants to just forget about it. But anyway, she stood on her, her laurels. And with her level of integrity, she was not going to back down. So Lee did not back down. And she stood her ground and she said, until Lockheed Martin does the following things, A, B, and C, they are not going to get this progress payment released, nor is the Navy going to get this asset. They have to do their job per the contract, and it's per the contract. So she stood her on her laurels. She had significant personal integrity in the face of adversity, and she did file a complaint against that Navy captain, and yes, he was called in by Air Lant and admonished and uh, that pretty much ended his career as a supply corps captain, or I think he, he might, no, I think he was lying, but it pretty much ended his career. Why? Because of profane language, his improper and unprofessional behavior towards not only Lee, a female, but also towards me. And he had done it to several other people too. He was known as in the Navy as a screamer and if you've ever worked for a screamer he would scream on the phone he would scream out in the hallway and everybody was scared to death of this guy lack of leadership but at the time evidently in the late 90s they they tolerated it well they won't tolerate that kind of behavior anymore but that's just one example where you have to have personal solid integrity to put up against bullshit like that from anybody. You don't take crap like that from anybody. Okay, that was one situation. Now, another was when I was just a little old GS-11 working at the Navy Regional Contracting Center in Norfolk, Virginia. I had just gotten a job there as a contract administrator. And our, my boss was a 13, and his boss was a 14. His boss was a black, retired Air Force master sergeant in procurement. And that's okay, but that's not a lot of background. Because, hey, me, I had a 4,500 hours. I had taken over 50 different courses. I was a professor of contract management. <laughs> so the equivalency of my background versus the guy that was the 14 was nothing. And that particular guy who worked, who was my boss's boss, um, I can't even really remember his name, probably because I tried to put it out of my mind, but Jim Hudgens was my direct supervisor, and he was a great mentor, excellent teacher, really good mentor. 
and he was very calm and mild-mannered in everything that he did, which is what you need to be. You need to be professional, calm, and mild manner, and have a lot of integrity. His boss had none of that. His boss was a screamer. His boss intimidated everybody in the office. Now, at that time, our office had 18 people in it. They had just lost three, and I was hired to replace three desk that had been previously filled by three different females. So I had a lot of work backed up that I had to get to and get accomplished. Jim just kind of let me do what I needed to do to set up and get up and running. And over a period of time, Jim learned that I was very much um, by the book, willing to learn, willing to do anything as long as it was correct. Well, lo and behold, after about a half a year of working there in the admin office, I heard, overheard Jim's boss, the retired black sergeant, say to Jim and to the other lady, other 13 that he worked with, Hey, Jim, you know that contract that we need done, that modification? We need it done fast. And uh, he says, Come in here and bring the file. And you're overhearing this stuff, and you're wondering what the hell they're talking about. So pretty soon... Jim comes out and he goes, go in, so-and-so wants to talk to you, my boss. And he proceeded to tell me what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, and basically what he was telling me was that I was going to be breaking the law and not following the federal acquisition regulations, the NARSUP, and, um, and basically violating everything that... Uh, we as contract specialists know we have to follow. Well, that's not the way I operate. So I said, nope, that's not going to happen. And he goes, what do you mean it's not going to happen? I, I just told you to, what to do, and I want it done, and I want this contract award made pronto. And I said, well, uh, not that way. It's going to be competed because um, I'm not going to falsify information and do something that you want me to do just because you tell me you want it done just because you're a Thir uh, 14, and I'm a lowly old GS-11. He said, so you're telling me that you're not going to do it? I said, pretty much. I said, you can get somebody else to do it, but I'm not breaking the law for you. And I walked out. All of a sudden, I heard, Jim, get your ass in here. And Jim goes, oh, shit, what did you say to him, Bob? I said, eh, you'll find out. So Jim goes in, and I heard some yelling behind the door. And uh, don't ever have that goddamn guy come in here again telling me what the fuck he's not going to do. Jim comes out and he goes, well, you really pissed a bunch of people off. I said, no, I didn't. I just pissed him off. <laughs> and he goes, well, uh, gosh, Bob, as long as you're here, that's not the way to win friends and influence people. And I said, well, Jim, I'm not going to break the law. I said, if you want me to do it, I'll do it correctly. It's going to take time. We're going to compete it. And, um, we're going to do the necessary steps, and it's not going to happen overnight. And Jim goes, well, that's kind of like what I figured you'd say. He goes, okay. So so Jim went ahead as a 13, and he did it himself. I guess I'm not sure whether he violated the rules, but I wasn't going to violate the rules. So basically what I did was I let it be known there and that particular day who I was by standing up and having integrity and by not violating any ethical protocols of contracting. And in doing so, I really made a name for myself in that office. My God, every one of those 18 employees, they said, boy, that guy, Nauer, he's really got some balls. That guy, that guy's to be respected. He went up against so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, from that day forward, Jim's boss never would acknowledge me, never would speak to me. Like that was a big deal, right? And every morning he'd come in and he'd go, Hello, Jim. Hello, Mary. Hello, everybody. And he would just walk right past me. And I said, You know what? I'm going to start bothering the shit out of this guy. Next time he comes in in the morning, I'm going to go, Good morning, Mr. So-and-so. i go, Good morning, Mr. So-and-so. And, and he would just bristle at me because how dare that guy that refused to do what I told him illegal to do is just sitting there and smiling and saying good morning to me. But I also knew I had to get out and go to a different organization if I wanted to get promoted, which is what I did within the next four months. I got promoted to a GS-12 in a different Navy organization and had a pretty good run of that. Uh, but again, that comes down to integrity, not being willing to break the law, uh, following the rules and procedures. Now, there's all kinds of crap that happens in the military. 
Um, in some ways, you can skirt rules um, and not get in trouble. And in other ways, you will get in trouble. And um, you have to pick and choose your battles wisely. So now I'm going to tell you one last story before I wrap this thing up. And it's a story of about a guy named Jim. That's not his real name, but he worked in the U.S. Public Health Service in Bethesda at the time, and he was a um, U.S. Public Health Service lieutenant. And he had been made the COR, or back in the old days you would have called him a COTAR, C-O-T-R, Contracting Officer's Representative, basically the person responsible for quality assurance of service and production contracts. And Jim had been assigned on this um, large production construction contract going on in Bethesda. It was like a $15 million contract for the build of a building to um, be the COR. Well, to be the COR, you had to go to training. He didn't get any. His boss refused to send him to training. He was supposed to be certified in writing that he had received all the proper training and credentials. He didn't have it. And he was also misled by his GS-15 boss or supervisor, if you want to call him that, that uh, he would simply have to follow all of his directions. So his supervisor would basically tell him what to do, what he wanted done, sign this invoice, sign that other invoice. And this guy, Jim, a young lieutenant, had no idea what he was doing, whether it was right or wrong. So here I was teaching a class that my company put on, I put on at Bethesda. And Jim's in my class and he walks up to me and he says, uh, and he looked rather nervous like uh, he had seen a ghost or something. And I had just gone through a series of lectures about invoicing, proper procedures, filing false official claims, which is a criminal violation, and basic ethics rules for being a COR. And uh, he had a terrified look on his face. So I said, what seems to be the issue? And he goes, uh, let me ask you a couple questions. And he goes, and he tells me I did this and this and this and this. Should I have done those things? And I said, no, not really, because it sounds like to me like you're telling me you broke the law. I said, uh, and it really doesn't matter whether you did so intentionally or not intentionally, you have broken the law. And he goes, can I get in a lot of trouble for this? I said, yeah, you can go to prison. And he started to really get big eyes and, and concerned. And he says, what should I do? I said, well, um, obviously your training that you're getting right now is a day late and a dollar short, but you basically need to question everything that your boss is telling you because what your boss is telling you is not correct. Um, you're certifying invoices, not even knowing if the work was done. That's, um, that's a no-no. And then your boss told you to submit an invoice for something that's not even in the contract. That's definitely illegal. Uh, you can't do it. If it's not listed on the contract, you can't pay for it, and you can't sign it, certify an invoice. So sure enough, things got bad. So we wrapped up the class, and then all of a sudden, about four weeks later after this class had wrapped up, I get this phone call at my house at 7.30 in the morning. And I was living in the villages at the time after I had retired. And I hear this guy with a very nervous voice telling me who it is. This is Jim. I think I'm in trouble. And I said, well, what kind of trouble are you in? And he tells me, I had the Office of Inspector General come to my home last night and they, they had a letter of referral to the Department of Justice they're going to charge me with a crime. And I said, well, okay. He goes, what should I do? And I said, well, I said, you're in a real pickle because obviously um, somebody turned you in and um, it's not for me to get involved. But the best advice I can give you, Jim, is that you shut your mouth, get an attorney, a criminal attorney, as fast as possible and uh, listen and do everything that you're criminal attorney tells you to do and say nothing to any more investigators or special agent without your attorney being present. Well, to make the story short uh, and to show you, to demonstrate how important integrity, ethics, and following the rules are, 
Uh, Jim ended up spending almost a quarter million dollars. He had to go and hawk with his family, um, borrow from family members, take out a loan on his house in order to be able to pay his legal defense attorney, former criminal attorney that I knew to recommend an attorney for him up in Maryland. He spent three and a half years back and forth uh, doing interviews with his attorney being present, talking to investigators. It turned out the Department of Justice and the um, HHS in Office of uh, Investigations, they didn't want Jim. They knew that Jim's boss, the 15, was the crook. They knew that he was receiving kickbacks from um, the contractor for the build of the construction, and they wanted him. But in order to get to him, they had to get to Jim and get Jim to turn the tables on his supervisor, his direct supervisor. Well, the problem is that Jim didn't do anything. He didn't put things in writing. He didn't put memos for the record like, Comey did, and he just didn't cover his tracks, so basically he could get hung out to dry really easy. His boss, on the other hand, put nothing in writing, made nothing phone calls, any illegal conspiracy that he was doing with the contractor, he did in person, face-to-face, no phone calls, no ability to track him, no records, no proof. So... Ultimately, the Department of Justice and their investigators figured out, we just can't indict this guy. We have nothing on him. The only person we have something on is this guy, Jim. And we don't really want to put this poor little bastard in prison who just was stupid. That's the bottom line. So, in the final analysis... Jim ended up spending a quarter million dollars of his own funds and paying back relatives to prevent his going to prison. In fact, I received an uh, email from Jim about three years and two months into this back and forth between the Department of Justice, and he was really concerned. He said, well, it looks like I'm going to be going to prison for five to six years. That's what they're threatening me with, and uh, I don't see any way out of this. So he was really despondent. I actually thought the guy was going to commit suicide, but lo and behold, that's when the whole uh, FEMA thing, FEMA investigation of Katrina happened, and they needed Department of Justice uh, prosecuting attorneys left and right. So the female prosecutor who was the last person to prosecute Jim, and he had actually gone through three previous prosecutors. One would get called up for a more important case. One got pregnant. And then the last one that he had finally said, you know what, this case, if we, don't, we never really wanted Jim. What we wanted was his GS-15 supervisor. So they ended up dropping the case. They didn't charge him with anything. They just dropped the case. So even though Jim was able to stay out of prison, he was really staring down five to six years in the federal pen, he did have to spend a quarter million dollars of his own money to defend himself in all the back and forth meetings that took place over three and a half years. So if that should teach you anything, because he could have ended up in jail, proves that if you fuck up and you don't do your job correctly and you don't have integrity and ethics and you don't document, 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 that's where you can end up. So think about that when you think about a sleight of hand. Think about that when you think of doing something wrong. Think about that when you couldn't possibly jeopardize your marriage, your family, the the future of your children, your house, uh, your home, everything that you ever built, all because you didn't, let's see, what's the way to say that? Because you were ignorant of the rules. One more thing. The charges that Jim were charged with by DOJ that he was staring down was conspiracy to commit fraud and also willful blindness because believe it or not you're being willfully blind or ignorant to the rules is no excuse it'll get you convicted and put in prison under 18 usc so if you're going into government contracting you better goddamn well know the rules and abide by them 
And you better be an ethical person because if you're not an ethical person, if you all your life going through college and whatever have skirted the rules, contracting is not the area you need to be in. Anyway, with that, food for thought, Bob out.